Well, I'm going to ask you please to turn to the 117th Psalm, if you would please. Psalm 117. Psalm 117. We're going to read the entire psalm. Both verses. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's ask His blessing on His Word this morning. Father, we have gathered here today to hear from You. And Lord, when we hear your word, we have heard from you. We ask you to be our teacher. May your Holy Spirit take his word in hand and deal with us this day. Lord, you know our needs better than we do. So deal with us, Lord, not according to our knowledge of ourselves, but according to your perfect knowledge of us. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been dealing with the subject of the church over the past several weeks, with the exception of last week when we looked into the book of Joshua, but we've been dealing with the subject of the church, and we've talked about the importance of the church, the identity of the church, the function of the church. We've talked about the witness of the church, the purity of the church, the discipline of the church. This morning, I want us to begin thinking about the worship of the church. The worship of the church. And when we talk about the subject of worship, I want us to realize that we are dealing with the most important issue we could possibly be dealing with. Several years ago, John MacArthur wrote a book. He entitled that book, The Ultimate Priority. And that's quite a title, isn't it? Not just a a great priority, not just one priority among many priorities, Not just a high priority, but he said in his title, the ultimate priority. That is, no matter what you might be asking about, if you were to ask, what is my priority here? What is the priority I should have in my marriage right now? What is the priority I should have in raising my children? What is the priority I should have when I go to work tomorrow or to school tomorrow? What is my priority in this problem that I'm facing? What should my priority be in the midst of this test, in the midst of this trial? You see, no matter what you would be asking about, when you say it's the ultimate priority, the answer is always this. And the subject matter that MacArthur dealt with in that book was the subject of worship. And I don't don't believe that he overestimated the subject matter when he titled the book The Ultimate Priority because that is the ultimate priority. The ultimate priority set forth for us in Scripture is that we would worship the true and living God in every area of our lives, in every part of our walk, that worshiping Him would be the chief thing. We're reminded of that in this psalm, Psalm 117. It is, if it were to be considered a chapter, it is the shortest chapter in all the Bible. It is the shortest psalm in the entire book of Psalms. But as Derek Kidner has said, its faith is great and its reach is enormous. It's a little psalm, but it is packed full of enormous truth. And we'll see that this morning and then we'll return tonight at our Thanksgiving fellowship and we'll look at this psalm again. This morning, though, I want us to begin with, with the first thing that we notice here. Read it with me again. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. The first thing we notice here is this is a call for worship. This is a call for worship. Praise the Lord. That's the call. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all nations. Peoples. The first word, the word translated praise there, carries the idea of boasting. The second word, extol, more of the idea of congratulating or commending. 
And so the call then is to glory in the Lord. To personally acknowledge His glory. To boast in who He is. What He has done. To recognize His greatness and the fact that what He has done is worthy of the commendation of all of His creatures. All peoples, all nations should commend God for who He is and for what He's done. Boast in Him. Glory in Him. That's what we're being called to do in this psalm. That's what everyone in this building right now, in light of this psalm, is being called to do. To glory in the Lord. And right away, when we recognize that, along with everything else we see in Scripture, we begin to get a grasp on what worship really is. This is an explanation of worship. This is a definition of worship. To worship is to pay homage to a superior. It is to bow before a superior. It is to to pay honor to a superior being. The most common word used in the New Testament for worship is the word proskuneo. And it literally means to kiss toward or to kiss the hand. If you think about, you've seen perhaps in a movie or something, someone kissing a ring on a king's hand. It is to bow down, to prostrate oneself before a superior and to pay homage. That is the idea of the word. And as you can recognize in the word, it doesn't necessarily always refer to God, to the true God. In fact, when you look for the word worship throughout the Bible, you're going to find It's not only used in reference to true worship, the word is also used in reference to false worship. Everybody in this place this morning is a worshiper, everyone. The question is, are you a true worshiper? Is your worship directed where it should be directed? Everyone here is paying homage to something or someone, but are you paying respect to and giving honor to the one whom you should be giving honor to? In the Bible, you see the worship of idols. You see the worship of angels. You see the worship of kings. You see the worship of creatures. You see the worship of material things. But here in Psalm 117, we're being called upon to give worship to the Lord. And by the way, the word Lord there is the proper name for God. It's Jehovah. Give praise to Jehovah. Give Extol His name. Worship. The true God. That's what this psalm calls us to do. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Hear, O Israel, there's one God and you're to love him with all that you are. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Lord, who who will not fear you? Who will not glorify your name? Everyone should, because you alone are holy. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them Or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so we recognize that what's being called for in this psalm and throughout the scriptures is that we worship God the living God, the true God, the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, we worship Him exclusively. And we worship Him exclusively not because there are many gods and He's the chief among them. We're called upon to worship Him exclusively because there's only one true God and He is that God. 
There's no one else who is God. And so he alone is the proper object of worship. That's why in this psalm you'll notice the whole world is called to worship him. Right? All nations. All nations. All peoples. Someone could say, well, wouldn't it be okay for Israel to worship Jehovah? And the other nations to worship their gods? I mean, is evangelism really important? I mean, why are we engaging in missions? Why not leave those people to their gods and we'll worship our God? Wouldn't that be okay? And the Bible's answer is no. And if you ask why not, the answer is because there's only one true God. And that true God must be worshipped. In fact, to leave people to, to the worship of any other God is to leave them to the worship of demons. It's to leave them to the worship of gods that are not gods, that don't really exist. It's to leave them in a position of ignorance and lostness and lifelessness and one day damnation. That's why there's evangelism. That's why there are missions, because to leave the peoples, the nations, to any other God than Jehovah is to leave them to a false God. This was Paul's message and his understanding. Acts chapter 19, verse 26. It says, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. That's what he was saying. These gods that you worship, you worship in ignorance. They don't really exist. In fact, that, uh, that, that uh, little idol you set up over there, that, that memorial to the unknown God, I want to proclaim him to you. I want you to know who the true God is, and he's unknown to you right now. And he, of course, preached Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Formerly, when you did not know God, now he's speaking to Gentiles, who grew up in a, in a culture of idolatry and paganism. He's talking to them about their past before they knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Galatians 4, 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. You worshipped as God that which is not God. Do you realize, if your God is not the God of the Bible, who is known through faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Whatever God you have is a God that exists only in your mind. A God of the imagination. A God of dreams. And damnable dreams at that. Deceptive dreams. And so Psalm 117 calls us to the worship of one. Praise Jehovah, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. Praise the Lord. So, this is the definition of worship. It is to bow down before the true and living God. It is to give Him the honor that He is due. It is to recognize Him for who He is, to boast in Him, to commend Him and congratulate Him for who He is and what He's done. That's worship. As soon as we think about the definition of worship, we also begin to get a grasp on the essence of it. The essence of worship, then, is what the creature gives to the Creator. The essence of worship is us giving honor to God, the honor that He deserves, the honor that He's worthy of. And for that honor to be sincere, flowing from a true heart recognition on our part, that He is indeed worthy of that honor. I'll say it to you this way. Worship is about giving. It's not about getting. Worship is giving to God what God is due and what God is worthy of. And just stop for a moment and let that sink in. I want to ask you, why did you come to church today? Did you come to give or did you come to get? Isn't it telling, isn't it telling that we're living in an age in church history right now where there's so much emphasis on being sensitive to the seeker? 
That is, what we're being told is the way to do church is to make sure you're giving people what they what? What they want, what they desire. In other words, they are the consumer. The people are consumers. And we're coming to church to get. What do I need? What do I feel I need? What do I want? In fact, it's not uncommon among people who say they believe the Bible to hear in their thinking, in their mindset, This idea that there's something I need and it's the church's responsibility to give me what I need. They're coming as consumers. I want to ask you, did you come today as a consumer? Or did you come as an investor? Did you come to give to the Lord the glory and the love and the praise and the admiration that He is worthy of? That's worship. It's not getting. It's giving. It's the creature giving to the Creator what he is due. That's worship. If you can think about it this way, ministry comes down from God to us. Ministry comes from the Father through His Son, by the Holy Spirit, through the gifts that He's distributed among His people. Ministry comes down from God to us. Worship flows from us back to God by the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, to God. That's the difference between ministry and worship. We minister to one another, but we worship God. And ultimately, everything we do in the church is to be for that end. It is to stimulate worship in God's people. When we sing songs together, we're not singing. We're not supposed to be singing for our enjoyment. Now, we enjoy singing, I'm sure. But ultimately, singing is not designed for the enjoyment of us. Singing is designed to give glory To God. It is to be a heart recognition on our part of who He is and what He's worthy of so that we're singing to His glory. Whether we're singing about Him and His attributes or we sing some songs to Him in a personal way. In either case, it is to magnify God as He is. That's why it's so important that what we sing be true. You know, so many songs in our day and age, and I guess it's been true throughout church history, whenever songs go wrong... So many times people measure a song by how it makes them feel. And what's amazing is to hear people sing things that aren't true, yet with great emotion, because it makes them feel good. The music is just right, or the words somehow have a feeling that sort of evokes an emotion in them. But the first test of everything we sing is to be, is it true? Because if it's not true, it's missing the mark, isn't it? It's not about how it makes us feel. It's about extolling God For who he is. So if what I'm singing isn't the truth about God, it's not worship, is it? It's not worship. Even if the emotion is right, if the message is wrong, it's not worship because I'm not giving to God what he's truly worthy of. I'm not telling the truth about him. And if you ask what giving is about, material giving, when we gather in this place to give out of that which God has provided for us, what is the reason that we give? It's not for how it makes us feel. We give materially to acknowledge God as the provider of all that we have and the sustainer of all that we are. And it is to honor him with that which he has called for from us. First fruits, acknowledging that all these things have come from God. And now we're going to invest those things back into the work of the kingdom. That's what it's about. It's about worship. It's about worship. I was thinking this week, I heard some song about the fact that uh, we only have 100 years to live. And it's an emotional song. You know, here you are at age 15, and then you're at 22, and then you're at 33, and then you're at 45, and then you're at 67, and then you're at 99. And, you know, here's how you've got to live, because you've got, only got 100 years to live. And I thought to myself, but I don't just have 100 years to live. In fact, I may not have 46 years to live. I've got a limited amount of time on this earth. But I'm going to go on in existence forever. Life is not this 100-year bank that you're taking withdrawals from. And so you're living your life with just 100 years of life to live. And you're, you're withdrawing from it. In other words, you're a consumer. You're consuming this 100 years. Do you know who thinks like that? The world that says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Listen, you've got a limited amount of time, so you better, you know, make the most of the withdrawal. No, we're not 
consumers, even in our life, are we? We are investors. We're taking this time that God has given us as a gift, and we are to be investing it in eternity. Laying up treasures in heaven. So that I'm thinking not about 100 years, I'm thinking about eternity. And what I do here on this earth must stand the test of eternity. Because there's an eternity that's coming. Either with God in heaven or in a place of torment in hell. And only if you know Christ will you be with God in heaven. And then what is preaching meant to do? Preaching is meant to stir up God's people to worship Him. Preaching is meant to convey the truth of God's Word so that we will know the truth about God, know the truth about what God has done, know the truth about who God is in our lives, that we might then give to God the worship that He's due, the praise, the adoration, the love, the appreciation, the thankfulness, the awe, the amazement at who He is and what He's done. That's the purpose of preaching. It is to lead people to worship the true and living God first through faith in Christ, and then through the growing knowledge of who God is. So this call to worship gives us a definition of worship. It is to bow before the superior being, the creator, to bow before him and to acknowledge him for who he is. And it is giving, it's not taking. It's giving, it's not getting. Now how is this done? This gets to the third thing I want us to to note about this call to worship. How are we to do this? What's required in order to give God worship? The first thing is faith. I mean, the psalm calls us to praise Jehovah, but you won't do that unless you believe that He is God. Unless you recognize His steadfast love and you've experienced it. Unless you recognize His faithfulness. And you believe it. The beginning place for worship is to believe God. How can you honor God when you refuse to believe Him? To refuse to believe God is to dishonor Him. All worship begins with faith. And I say this not only to the unbeliever, Because this is where worship on your part must begin. You must believe God when He tells you that you're a sinner. You must believe God when He tells you that you're estranged from Him. You must believe God when He tells you that the only way for you to be reconciled to Him is through the gift of His Son and His Son's death on a cross for your sins. You must believe God for your worship to begin. You must believe Him right there. But I'm also speaking to believers in this place. That our worship, every moment of every day, only exists where we're believing God. Where we don't trust Him, where we don't believe His Word, where we will not walk in what the Scriptures reveal to us, that is not a life of worship. Wherever you are not submitted to Scripture, right there, you are not worshiping God. Worship exists where there's faith. This psalm calls us to faith. Praise Jehovah, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That means you must believe Him. Second, where there is true worship, there is submission to Him. I mean, it's possible for someone to hear this message, to hear that Jehovah is God, and perhaps even intellectually acknowledge, all right, I mean, I, you know, if you go, go really far back to the time of the Exodus, I mean, there's, there was no denying the Red Sea parted. There was no denying God delivered this people out of Egypt. But Pharaoh still wasn't bowing, was he? He saw what the God of Moses did through the plagues and through all of that. He saw it, but he would not submit. Where there's true worship, not only is there understanding that God is God, but there's a submission to him. You worship God by bowing before Him. You submit yourself to His authority. You come under His authority. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, what does it say? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
And when he talks about submitting your body, he's not just talking about your physical body. He's talking about your whole person. It it is equal with what's been said earlier. We read earlier, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. What's worship? What's your spiritual service, your reasonable service to God in light of his mercies? It's when you say, here am I. Here I am. Body, soul, mind, strength, all that I am. Submitted to your authority. All that I am in your hand. That's worship. And so when we think about submission, we must always begin just with us, with our hearts, with our minds, with our lives. Are we submitted to the Lord to the degree that we should be? All of us. And so where there's true worship, there's faith, there's submission, there's something else we can say. Where there's true worship, there's obedience. You see, it's easy to pay lip service to God. Here I am, Lord. And then His Word says something specific to us that runs contrary to our emotions, contrary to what we would want to do. And we go on paying the lip service to God, but we will not obey what His Word says. That's not worship. Worship is not nice things said about God. Worship is praise given to God from a heart, from a life that is truly submitted to Him, which is to say a life that is set on obeying Him. Will you obey Him? 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. What does God want from us today? Not a, not a sacrifice that we bring with our hands. We're the sacrifice, a living sacrifice, and worship to God is to hear Him, to obey Him. God says, this is the way in which you should walk, and we say yes. That's worship. That's worship. It's the life set on obeying God. So there's faith, there's submission, there's obedience where there is worship. In fact, to praise God is obeying this psalm. To extol him is to obey this psalm. Praise the Lord, all nations. That includes us. Extol him, all peoples. Will you obey him today? Do you, will, you, will you give him the glory that's due his name? In every area of your life. There's a fourth thing we can say about true worship. It includes the idea of delight. You believe him. You're submitted to his authority. You obey him. But it's not. It's not cold. It's not mechanical. True worship is not mechanical. Well, God is God. And therefore, I'm to be submitted to his authority. And therefore, I should look at scripture and see what it says. And therefore, I should seek to do it. That's not worship. Worship comes from a heart that has been so changed by God that now there is love for God in the heart. There's desire for God in the heart. There is delight in God in the heart. We heard about it in the the realm of giving this morning, that where there's true giving, there's delight. There's cheerfulness. There's a desire for it. That's true of every area where we serve God. There's to be desire for it. Psalm 111, verse 2, listen to this. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Isn't that marvelous? His works are great, but who studies those works? The people who delight in those works. They're the ones who study the works. The ones who delight in the works. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Or the passage we read this morning at our time of scripture reading. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I'm a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests who despise my name? 
But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? And then, my how this statement has always struck my heart. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? I wonder in how many of our cases this morning, God would say to us, your worship is unacceptable to me. And we would say, why is it unacceptable? And God would say, because would you give that to your governor? Would you bring that, that level of intensity, that level of zeal, that level of desire, that level of sacrifice, would you bring that to your boss? I mean, in how many cases are we offering to God less than what we offer to human beings? We give God less at church than we would give Him at the job. We give God less in our worship than we would give Him in our families. We give God that which is sick, figuratively speaking, that which is lame, that which is our leftovers. And we call that worship? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors. That you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among The nations and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. We're going to talk about that more tonight. God promises that he will have worshipers. And he does and he will. Verse 12, but you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, listen to this, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. You know, you get the picture, right? Oh, got to go to church. That's worship. When we act like service to the Lord is weariness. So for there to be true worship, not only must there be faith and submission and obedience, but that submission and obedience is the delight of our heart. It's what we desire, it's what we delight in, it's what we look forward to, it's what we're excited about, it's what we give our best to, our very best. That's worship. There's a fifth thing we can say about it. Faith, submission, obedience, delight. And then out of that, there's praise. Praise, praise Him. That is, it is it is from our hearts, but it's on our lips. We tell of the Lord's greatness. We speak about the Lord with one another and to the world. We tell of His glory. That's a part of true worship. Whether it be in song or in preaching or in common everyday speech, we tell of the greatness of the Lord because He is the delight of our hearts. If you want to know whether or not you're a worshiper, one of the ways you can examine that is just just take note of how much you actually talk about him in your common conversation. If you love him, if you delight in him, I know this about you, you can't help yourself when it comes to telling of his greatness. Must be from the heart, however. You know that. Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. You hypocrites... Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
When you have God on your lips, but your heart is far from Him, that's vain worship. Empty, meaningless. It's not worship. It won't be accepted. Praise should not be difficult for us. Because God is indeed praiseworthy, isn't He? You know what it is when we praise the Lord? We're simply recognizing His beauty. We're recognizing the truth about Him. We don't have to make things up about God in order to praise Him. We just need to recognize what's true of Him. And as soon as you recognize the truth about God, you recognize He's the only one worthy of praise. Because He is the ultimate. Talk about the ultimate priority. He is the ultimate one in the entire universe. And anything that's praiseworthy, anything that's beautiful, He is the ultimate in it. You talk about power. He possesses all power. If you talk about wisdom, is there anyone wiser than God? Who else knows the end from the beginning? Who was there besides God when it all came into being? Just God. Don't you know God sits in the heavens and laughs as men try to figure out the origins of this universe? Instead of just believing God. I mean, after all, there's only one person who was there. God. And he's told us in the book of Genesis how he did it. And I'm going to tell you something. We can study it to the end of our lifetime and a thousand lifetimes. And when it's all said and done, if what we say differs from what Genesis says, we're wrong. God was there. He's told us how he did it. Is there anyone wiser than God? No. If you admire grace, is there anyone more gracious than God? Anyone more merciful? Anyone more loving? You want to talk about patience? Is there anyone more patient than God? Faithfulness. Anyone more faithful than God? Holy, pure, perfect. God alone is perfect. Just, the author of peace and comfort. We, we do our best to be conduits of peace and comfort to one another. The Lord, in fact, will comfort one another through the comfort that He gives us. But ultimately, if you talk about who's the author of peace and comfort, it's God. And so when we praise the Lord, all we have to do is just take a moment. And we get so busy we don't do this. Just take a moment and take note of what's beautiful, what's worthy of praise, and recognize that God is the author of it all, and He is the ultimate in it all, so that to praise Him is just to recognize and to commend Him for who He is and what He's done. Faith, submission, obedience, delight, and praise. All of this goes into worship. I want to finish this morning by saying this. We're going to come back to it tonight and see some other things, but... Let me finish by saying this. The worship of God begins with salvation. I said that, but I want to underscore it. The worship of God begins with salvation. You cannot worship God until you know God. You don't know God until you've repented of your sins and accepted the gift of salvation in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are born sinners, deserving of the wrath of God by nature. Children deserving of wrath. God loved the world in this way that He sent His only begotten Son. That whosoever would believe upon Him would not perish but have everlasting life. God accomplished salvation in a way that is both gracious and accords with justice. He doesn't take sins and just act like they didn't happen. He doesn't just sweep them under a rug. Sin had to be paid for. And so God's own Son, the perfect Son of God, came to this earth, took to Himself a sinless human nature, lived a sinless life, so that he didn't deserve the penalty of sin, which is death. Yet he died on a cross as a substitute, paying for all the sins of all those who will put their trust in him. And it was proven that he is who he claimed to be, and that the Father accepted that payment when he raised his son from the dead. And now he's ascended back into heaven, and the gospel goes forth in the hand of the Holy Spirit, 
declaring to the world there's a way for sinful man to be right with God. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ and you will be saved. And that's where worship begins when you bow before God by bowing before His Son. When you bow before God by trusting in His Son and giving Him your life. Remember we said worship is giving yourself to the Lord. Well, that's where it begins. Give yourself to Christ. Trust in Him as Lord and Savior. Worship begins with salvation. Worship grows through sanctification. Worship grows through sanctification. The more we learn, the more God grows us, the more that our minds are changed and conformed to the Word of God, to the image of Christ, the more we recognize the beauty of God. The more we recognize how good He's been to us, how kind He's been to us, how merciful He's been to us. I mean, we we move to the end of our walk with God and we say, I'm the chief of sinners. How could God have saved someone like me? It's just His grace and mercy. The more I grow, the more I see how good God is and how blessed I am. Worship grows through sanctification. Are you growing? Can you say that you're growing in gratefulness? Can you say you're growing in thankfulness? Can you say that you're growing in the desire to lay all that you are and all that you have before the Lord in worship? Can you say you're growing in that? You should be. If you're, I know this. If you're growing, you are. If you're growing spiritually, you are. Because growth in the spiritual life is growth in worship. Which leads to the final thought. That is, the worship of God requires consecration. You can't worship Him and worship other things. To worship Him is to be consecrated to the Lord. We talked about it last Sunday. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's worship. Will you worship Him? Will you answer the call of this psalm? The first thing we see is this is a call to worship. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him. All peoples. That's a command to you. Will you heed it today? Will you worship the true and only and living God? Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this call. And Lord, I know this, those of us who belong to you through your Son, We delight to answer it. We delight to say amen to it. We delight to obey it. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that, Lord, wherever sin is getting in the way of offering you true worship, Lord, I pray that we would put our sin away today that we would recognize it for the ugliness that it is and the, the offense that it is to you, and we would put it away and bow before you and give to you what you are truly worthy of, all that we are, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then, Lord, I pray for those who don't know the joy of knowing you. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would make them sick in their sin, that You'd bring them to a place of true sorrow over their condition before You. That, Lord, You would break them in order to heal them. That You would bring them low in order to lift them up. And I pray, dear Lord, that You would also at the same time shine into their hearts the knowledge of the glory that is yours in the face of your Son, that they would desire Jesus and delight in Him to the extent that they would run to Him for life. I pray for everyone in this place, Lord, who only has empty religion. And there's no joy in that, Lord. That's a miserable place to be. Lord, I pray that they would exchange empty religion For a true relationship with you. Coming to your son broken. Seeking 
in Him alone the forgiveness of their sins and reconciliation with You. Lord, wherever we've been serving You only with our lips and not with our hearts, or we've been giving You our lame and our sick and the leftovers of our life, I pray we would recognize You're a great King worthy of our best. And that, Lord, we would co- confess that as great sin and give to You only our best. And constantly ask ourselves, would we give that to our governor? Then let us not give it to our God. Oh, Lord, teach us these things, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.